Good afternoon. Welcome to the first SOG podcast. Actually, according to Jocko Willink, our sponsor for this uh, new endeavor, it will be called SOG Cast. Mm. So what is SOG? SOG was during the Vietnam War, an eight-year secret war that was conducted during the entire Vietnam War from 1964 to 1972. During that time, there were missions that were run where soldiers, the Green Berets who participated in those missions, signed documents saying they would never talk about it. Now, 50 years later, we're allowed to talk about it, and thanks to Jocko Willink and his production company, we are now going forward with a new episode and going forward with the stories about SOG. Today I'm joined by a longtime friend of mine, a fellow recon man, George Sternberg, who we served together at FOB1 Fubai in 1968. And George, welcome to the show, our historic first SOG cast, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Myers. Glad to have you here. And with our podcast, we have basically interviewing veterans, and with Jocko, there have been 10 SOG podcasts in the past where he conducted the interviews. My name is John Stryker Meyer, nicknamed Tilt. I've had the honor of being on several of Jocko's, actually eight podcasts with him, where we've reviewed the stories that are now being podcast through his different social medias. At the end of this show, we will refer to those and mention them. And with George joining us today, thank you for coming in. You're and uh, I'd like to uh, go to an early story to give you a little bit of a sense of what some of the SOG missions were like. And in this particular case, it was in May 1968. George was a member of the recon team. At that time, they were called Spike Teams. He was on Spike Team Oregon with the team leader, Mike Tucker, and a fellow team member, Mike Perry. Steve Perry. Steve Perry. Thank you very much. And uh, at that time, we'd had one of our recon teams, Spike Team Idaho, had disappeared. It was put into a target, and the team had literally disappeared in Laos. So the following day or two days afterward, Spike Team Oregon went into that target area to find out what happened to ST Idaho. And I'm going to turn to the book Across the Fence for a few paragraphs about that mission where George uh, participated with that. After the long flight across South Vietnam, the King Bees inserted ST Oregon on the same LZ where ST Idaho had been inserted, a small hill near a bomb crater. From the LZ, ST Oregon's point man found Idaho's trail through grass only a foot or two tall. The trail led down the hill. Within minutes, team members heard NVA in several locations hitting sticks together in an effort to force the team to move in a certain direction. At first, Sternberg hoped the NVA were beating the sticks in an effort to get Oregon and Idaho to move in a certain direction. They followed ST Idaho's tracks indirectly through the grass and down the hill. Ha, Sternberg, and Tucker knew that Lane, the team leader of ST Idaho, often planted little anti-personnel mines called toe poppers to hurt NVA trackers and to give his team warning of enemy activity on their trail. Because the vegetation was thin, the team increased the distance between team members. Tucker so soon saw an NVA flag on a post in the ground. Sternberg observed a large road at the bottom of the hill and an empty guard booth. Perry saw the guard booth and realized this was a road heavily traveled by NVA and Pathet Lao troops. Across the road, 
Tucker saw more than a dozen armed NBA soldiers heading towards them, but they were unaware of ST Oregon's exact location. Team members heard several trucks in the distance moving in their direction. Tucker wasted no time. He ordered the team back to the bomb crater while signaling Sturberg to radio Covey to report the enemy activity and the need for TAC air ASAP. Tucker wanted to keep the high ground advantage as long as possible. There was no question about it. The NVA knew another spike team was in the area and it was only a matter of minutes before Oregon would be fighting for its life. Sternberg pulled out his ERC-10 emergency radio and immediately made contact with air assets in the area. As ST Oregon moved into the bomb crater, several NVA soldiers opened fire on the team. Sternberg felt like he was in the middle of an old TV western as the NVA rounds kicked up the dirt around him. The NBA fuselage increased in ferocity and the entire team suddenly realized that among the weapons being fired at them were Colt Car 15s, weapons only carried by CNC spike teams. The NVA soldiers were now close enough to throw hand grenades into the large bomb crater. The team was spread around the lip of the crater, fending off attacks. Suddenly, three or four NVA soldiers ran down the incline straight toward ST Oregon, firing on full automatics. Sternberg thought several of the NVA were high on some sort of drug because even after he shot one of them twice, the momentum of the soldier's body continued to carry him toward the team before collapsing. Another NVA charged toward Sternberg, carrying grenades. As the enemy soldier started to throw a grenade, the Ohio native opened fire with his car 15. The rounds slammed into the NVA's body, tearing out huge chunks of flesh and shredding his uniform. But somehow, the enemy soldier continued his forward movement. More important, he threw the grenade. It was an American M26 frag grenade. Sternberg grabbed the grenade and threw it towards several charging NVA. Several more Chai Com, Chinese Communist grenades, were hurled into the crater, but most of them failed to detonate. The ones that did explode caused minimal damage to team members. Meanwhile, Sternberg directed several airstrikes by Air Force F-4 Phantom Jets between the bomb crater and the road. Then the single prop A-1 Sky Raider strafed above the crater where more NVA soldiers were firing down on ST Oregon. The Sky Raider's first gun runs were so close, Sternberg could count the rivets on the warplane. When the Sky Raider's wingmen followed with a second gun run, Tucker and Sternberg watched in awe as the 20 Mike Mike cannons instantly shredded the wood line and all the NVA in it. The gun run left Sternberg covered with dirt, wood chips, and leaves. He handed his sawed-off M79 grenade launcher to one of his Chinese Nung members, nicknamed Monkey. The Nung fired his M79 into the air, using the 40 millimeter high explosive round as small mortar fire. While using Sternberg's M79 to fire directly into charging NVA soldiers, another NVA charged the bomb crater and threw an M26 hand grenade towards the team. To Steve Perry's horror, he saw the M26 sail into the bomb crater and land a short distance from his feet. The SF medic was applying a bandage to one of ST Oregon's nuns who had been shot in the calf by an AK-47 round. As he moved to protect the nung, 
the M26 exploded, killing the young Vietnamese lieutenant who was on the other side of the bomb crater. It blew the jungle boots off Steve Perry and peppered him and several team members with hot shrapnel. Sternberg got hit in the leg, hip, elbow, and head. Shrapnel shredded one of his jungle boots. The power of the M26 explosion left Perry with no feeling from his shoulders down. He feared the shrapnel had caused a spinal column injury. Through the din, Tucker quickly inspected Perry's back for wounds or bleeding and found none. The impact of the explosion had temporarily stunned Perry. Still, he was amazed to be alive. And that is just one of the first chapters from Across the Fence where, as Jocko would say, the stories are just amazing and sometimes uh, beyond belief. I'm biased. We were all there together. But George, you were there that day in that crater. Yes, I was. Excuse me. That's all right. And uh, so talk to us a little bit because at that point when that hand grenade went off, your jungle boots are shredded. Yeah, I lost both soles off of both boots, and it it was almost like somebody took a razor knife and drug it across my feet, the bottom of them. But I didn't feel it. Uh, at one point, when that grenade come close to Steve, I had my fingertips on it, and it fell into a little bit of water underneath the... Uh, in the bottom of the bomb crater, and I couldn't find it. And at that instant, my buddy Mike Tucker reached down, grabbed me by the collar, and pulled me up into the ridge of the the top of the bomb crater. And then once we started to get air assets in, and the chopper ended up coming down to extract us, Steve was stunned. He couldn't even move. He was paralyzed. And uh, we had to find a way to get him out. And as soon as that chopper put its wheel down, I grabbed him, picked him up, and ran out of the bomb crater and put him on the chopper. And so before that, so how deep was the crater from the top down to the bottom? Because I'd have to, I'd have to just estimate. But That's good enough, 53 could, years later. I could stand up in the bottom and I still wouldn't be out and I'm only 5'4". So I would have to say it was pretty close to seven, eight foot deep Yeah, good. In, a, in a tapered situation. Yes, yeah. sir. So during that firefight, um, before the helicopter, which in this case was a South Vietnamese Air Force from the 219th that came in to, to pick up the team under extreme fire, um, how long were you actually engaged with the NVA from that first fire opening of the firefight with you and then shooting at the NVA charging your your bomb crater? Uh, well, we were, when that first chopper landed, we were, had been out of the crater for probably 20 minutes from the time we got on the ground. And we had spotted a couple flags, uh, like, Flags, NVA flags? NVA flags. When I flew in, um, the North or the South Vietnamese pilots or the King Bees have a tendency to roll them. They look like you're going to fall out the door. And it was a beautiful maneuver. It always helped us. The spiral, when it was spiraling. They spiraled in, and then as they turned to put that wheel down. The final flare. Yep. They rolled them, and it was almost like a almost like 180 degrees and they'd flip it and it always screwed up the North Vietnamese. They didn't think they could do it. <laughs> and when that happened, uh, out the window opposite the door, I seen a flag on a flagpole and Mike seen it too, but he didn't think how big it was. Well, it was pretty good size. And I just tapped him on the shoulder and I said, we're in trouble. And we no sooner hit the ground, 
Now, we took fire going in, but it wasn't real heavy. It was just enough that the pilot said. <laughs> like, right. So under ordinary circumstances, when you're on a recon team, a SOG recon team, you're getting inserted into Laos or Cambodia or North Vietnam. If you're on a regular mission and you took enemy gunfire, you would not continue. No, I think the the way of the bright light was a bright light was different. different. Yeah, because you're going in after your fellow recon team members. And then on a bright light, because it was different, um, you could explain just a little bit about how you carried more bullets, weapons. We carried I I was 112 pounds, but I carried the soaking radio. Wet. Soaking wet. <laughs> I carried the radio. I carried an ERP-10 radio, uh, high frequency. I carried uh, 20 magazines. I carried um, about 15 of the new baseball grenades, which were the right. M-26s. And uh, I also carried my other weapons. and The M-79, M-79 sawed off. off. Right, sawed off. I had some fouchette rounds in it. Um, and some hand grenades. For how many hand grenades? Uh, I had anywhere from probably 14, 15, 16 <laughs> grenades. And I carried uh, anywhere from 5 to 10 pounds of C4 with uh, blasting caps and stuff like this, just in case we run into an opportunity to tear some stuff up. But... Uh, it probably pretty close to doubled my weight, <laughs> <laughs> but I I've always been in good physical condition, so that never bothered me. And then um, when that hand grenade went off, that was like a really a major turning point for that brief time on the ground. Your jungle, I mean, to think about jungle boots that had, they were constructed with metal plates in the exactly. bottom. The hand grenade to have the force to blow or shred yours and to blow Steve Perry's boots off while making him basically feel paralyzed, at least momentarily. He, he was. He he was paralyzed clear until they until the chopper got him to the hospital. You know, and he still couldn't walk. He couldn't walk. He couldn't uh, twist his body. Uh, he could move a little bit on his hands and his head, but. Other than that, he couldn't get out of the bomb crater. All right, uh, then that's, I just want to go back to another uh, paragraph from the book. This that I to this day, fifty three years later, I remember hearing about. It was over the radio in front of the master or in sergeant major's office in the radio room at FOB one. Yes, sir. Right. By now, several team members were wounded from hand grenade, shrapnel, or AK forty seven gunfire. The fact that the shrapnel was from U.S. grenades led to the general assumption that the NBA had killed St. Idaho, and St. Idaho had the one zero Glen Lane. The one one was Robin Owen, and they had four or six indigenous troops with them. There were six of them. There were six all yeah. so total team was all eight altogether. Right, and that uh, Sergeant Lane was an experienced uh, one zero. And uh, Sergeant Owen was returning to the country for another tour of duty as a Green Beret. So they had a lot of experience as well as the indigenous people on the team. And uh, so Tucker directed a few more close airstrikes. Sternberg's ERC-10 emergency radio stopped working. He stuffed the dead battery in his check pocket and slammed a new one into the radio. Then the NBA lobbed mortar rounds toward the bomb crater. Sternberg was pissed because he knew he couldn't catch a mortar shell and throw it back. Shortly, the NVA mortarmen began to bracket the bomb crater with incoming rounds. As the mortar rounds marched toward the crater, Tucker directed Scarface to execute strafing runs. Right behind the gunships, the first King Bee landed to pick up the most seriously wounded members of ST Oregon. Sternberg, Perry, Ha, 
and the most seriously wounded Nung boarded the first King Bee, which quickly lifted off from the LZ. The second King Bee landed to pick up the remainder of the battered team. As the remainder of ST Oregon boarded the second King Bee, Sternberg's chopper circled the LZ to observe when the aircraft cleared the LZ. The first King Bee circled close enough that Sternberg and other team members fired their CAR 15s and M79s down at the NVA. An enemy bullet ripped through the King Bee's thin metal wall, lifted Sternberg from the window, and drove him across the floor of the H-34. And again, here for our audience, we should explain that the H-34 was an older helicopter. It had a single door on the right side, and then inside there were windows on the left side, two windows and a window on the right. And whenever a team got on, they would fire out both windows to support the helicopter and try to suppress enemy gunfire. And the pilots were above, but the passengers were in the lower part of the uh, compartment. And so you were by the window and around hit Sternberg in the chest. <laughs> I mean, as Jacques would say, I'm amazed you're still alive, sir. Oh, <laughs> Um, go ahead so from that point so after being in the bomb crater you're giving support fire you just catch a round in the chest that yeah, moment that, in time what what happened was um, as we were firing you could see groups moving larger groups moving through the area and they were headed to to the bomb crater so we knew if we didn't get out of there soon We'd all be history, and the chance, and then at that point, if we didn't keep suppressing and returning fire on them, they would just increase and increase and increase, and we wouldn't even get out with the choppers. Right. So, you know, at that point, when I got hit, it actually picked me up, and I'm moving across toward the doorway. Well, the doorway, the only person sitting in it is on the left side and that's the Vietnamese door gunner with a 30 caliber machine gun. He's firing away full blast. He was going full blast and the point man monkey that was the smallest he was like me he put his arm out and then I think it was Mike it had to be Mike no it was Steve. Uh, our tail gunner Bow grabbed me by the pants at the belt line and held me, or I'd have been out thousand foot maybe out the door. Oh my god! And all that did was I kept the battery pack and I buried it in my rucksack when I came home, and maybe three eighths of an inch. Out of the back of out of the back of the uh, battery pack, it had just barely pierced the skin to create a blood, and it cracked two ribs. Is that right? And that's it. Wow. You know, and and it's amazing, even at a thousand foot or more, and coming through the thin skin that they had on these choppers, that it didn't go all the way through me. You know, and already having several wounds, you know, I didn't even think about it. Yeah. I just. Well, some back. might argue that your skin was so thick by that time. You're so tough well, that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that could be. <laughs> but let me get back to the book here, because I, this is mind boggling for me, too. Even 53 years later, Sternberg sat on the floor amid the hydraulic fluids that were leaking from the King Bee. He was too stunned to move as several more enemy rounds ripped through the chopper. Ordinarily, as the commo man on the ST, Sternberg would have radioed Covey on the PRC or the ERC-10. And again, on the ERC-10, could you just describe a little bit of how the radio is? It's only a handheld, it's small, it's a and then that battery that saved your life was how thick. 
Not very. No. All yeah, right. and it slipped into the back, so the radio would be like five inches tall, maybe three inches on the side yeah. with control buttons, right. and then the battery slipped in the back, and you well, could detach kept, it. Uh, there was a uh, the battery pack that I had in my yeah. pocket. That was with a coax from the handheld section. Oh, is that there right? A coax okay. cable. You're right. That came around and attached to the top of the battery. Well, I always carried it in my left pocket. Wow. And I I don't know why. I'm left-handed, but I've always carried it the whole time I was in Vietnam. I carried it here. And it just at that instant saved my butt. Excuse me. Absolutely no. Yeah. We're just talking here. It's yeah. a little bit of the history of just another yeah. day in Sog. Yeah. It 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 happened like that every time we went in, just about to uh, on a bright light. Right. So at some point, the second half of the team gets pulled out, and the two king bees with the entire team turn around and head to head, return to FOB one and the food body get you to the medics. Right. And unbeknownst to Spider Parks, who was flying in the third backup helicopter. The chase chopper. The chase chopper. And in this case, for the uh, again, for our audience, when on a mission for an extraction, there would be a lead King Bee because of height, heat, they can only carry so many men. Right. And so your eight-man team, they pick up the first four. The second chopper comes in, picked up the second four. They're turning around, going back. Spider didn't realize he was in the third King Bee, and he didn't realize that the team had been fully extracted. He ordered the King Bee, the third King Bee, down on the LZ. Spider jumped out of the helicopter, ran into the bomb crater to see if anybody was left alive. And the only person there was the dead lieutenant that was killed in action. He gets back on the helicopter while under extreme enemy fire. As the helicopter is lifting off, the door gunner was killed. And then they all return to Fubai. So this was your brief visit to hell. Yeah. On yeah. that day. And yeah. um just you know, a part that didn't get into the book that came out at one of our reunions years later was the aspect of you and you still tell it better than I do because you were there when that story came out how you did pick up Steve Perry and put him in the helicopter. And you picked up a second team member. Yeah, I take it from there because I wanted to. Don't forget your little signal to our no. communist friends. Well, it happened after I put Steve in the chopper. They had just sat down. And there was no other way. We had somebody had to grab him. Mike and the rest of the team was returning fire to give us cover. I picked him up and threw him on the chopper. I think there was probably maybe 15 yards from the edge of the crater to where they sat. There. 15 yards? 15, and you're carrying him. And I carried him. And you I, had 112 pounds. <laughs> plus my rucksack and all the other garbage. I didn't have too many rounds left, and the magazines were gone, and just about all my grenades were gone. So you were traveling light. Yeah, I was traveling light then. <laughs> but I picked up Steve, and Steve was probably maybe 145. Yeah, he was a lean, mean yeah, fighting he was machine. A good medic. Then. Yeah. Yes. And the reason he went with us was because he was a he medic. Had, he he had been on the uh, on the previously. ground with Idaho before, right. and knew some of their maneuvers. So, and he was a good medic. And so once I got him on there, I turned around, and I didn't know this until probably five years ago. Spider said he looked over as I turned, somebody from above the bomb crater fired around it, went in my elbow and out the hole of one of the wounds from the grenade. And I turned around, emptied my magazine on him. For your car 15. The, yeah, with my car. At the same time, I flipped him off. Well, <laughs> I don't ever remember that, but Spider witnessed it, and he had 30-some years in the military as a command sergeant major, so I'm not doubting what he tells me. No. <laughs> and I left it at that. 
So that's how that story went. And I went back after our point man, which was pretty much, he was a little bit lighter than me yet. And I grabbed him and started for there. And then one other um, had shrapnel wounds. One other gentleman on the team uh, came up with us and the rest of them were on the second chopper. And uh, we took off and we did the same thing. We fired rounds at them and everything else. And other than Steve being stunned like that, and partially paralyzed, did we uh, we had him on the on the floor, and once he was there, then we started returning fire out the window and the door, and the the ship was getting hit all over the place. You can see just like little spots of light coming through. Indeed, and they so always they always once we got back on a lot of missions like that, they would. Uh, the door gunner would go around and take duct tape, go over the hole, and then paint black paint over them, and you wouldn't wouldn't <laughs> know they were there anymore. They looked like a new aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> Psyops. Yeah, <laughs> just another way. So and so from here you go back to Fubai. Well, we, we we started a touchdown in Fubai, and they must have got called and said they could fly into a. Uh, uh, army, like a mash unit. Right. There and, at Fubai? Yeah. Just down the highway yeah, one a little just bit. down the highway. Right. And we landed there, and we we were all with Steve and uh, the Vietnamese, I don't know, or the Chinese we had, were sent someplace else. And Mike, when that other chopper landed, and Steve, we were all put inside the unit. Because that was the night then we came down to, to check you, to see you guys. And yeah. you're all bandaged up by the time we get in there. Right. And then um, by that time, did Steve get some of his feeling back? Or how much longer oh, was that, he paralyzed? I didn't even see Steve. They must have taken him some Cause it's so to serious. A, different, a different area of the mass unit to take care of him. But they were, they were, they worked on his feet and his other shrapnel wounds. But uh, as for being paralyzed, I don't know what they did. All right. So for, in your case here, you get back, you eventually get medevaced out. So how did all this career begin for you, for you serving 10 years in the Army? Where did all this begin back in Oregon, Ohio, George? What, what inspired well, you to get into Special Forces? Well, we got a, uh, in the city of Oregon, their police department, they had a young officer, and I met him through the pal Jim. And he was a de uh, not actually a detective, but he was a member of the Oregon Police Force where I went to school. And I met him through the pal program, the athletes in the police department. And I boxed when I was younger, up until the time I went in the military, and he more or less participated working with the young young men. You play a little football too, right? Well, I played football and played ice hockey since I was five and played baseball as a catcher and played softball as an older man after the military. C certainly. <laughs> <laughs> but, and also wrestled in high school and captained the wrestling team at Oregon Clay High School. Um, I ended up with some pretty good records, you know, and I ran track and pole vaulted. So I was in excellent condition. I loved to swim. Uh, I stayed healthy. I ran every morning. A lot of times I had to walk home from school because nobody lit, was in the athletic program I was in, lived out where I did, and we were eight miles from school. No. So I had to go on the Route 2 that ran along Lake Erie and hitchhike because my dad worked second shift. <laughs> so either if I wanted to be participating in anything after school, I had to find my own way 
or walk or run. So, or all the above. Or all the above. That was, and I did it winter winter time because wrestling didn't start until <laughs> after football season was over. <laughs> and up there, October is a breaking line, right? Right along Lake Erie, and uh, yeah, I. So at I some point, you're about. talking to this to your to this officer. Officer, I it talk- came down to like. There's two spec ops units that he mentioned to you, Special Forces and Navy SEALs. SEALs. And they had just been starting the same Navy SEAL program with the UDT instructors. We're starting to train the new instructors that were supposed to be the SEAL instructors. Right. And he said physically, and this officer just happened to be a, a... XSF sergeant. Oh, is that so, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So I took heed at what he was telling me. And then my dad and all, he never explained a whole lot of what he did, but he served a tremendous amount of time. Well, your dad was a paratrooper in World War II. Right. So he was he, during World War II in Korea. And wow. He also was. A demo man is what he told me. So, <laughs> and some of the stuff other than that that he did was pretty similar to what we were starting to get into, you know, in in the SOG yes. era. And so I listened to him, and he's never steered me wrong. He said, "Don't do what you don't feel good about in your stomach and in your heart." So. He said, you've got two choices. You're an excellent swimmer. You're not afraid of the water. He said, you're in excellent physical condition, and you're no dummy. He (laughs) said, when you want to apply yourself, you'll be all right. And he said, whichever one you choose, I'll back you 100%. And so So he chose SF? He said, SF is more overall. You'll get more training. You'll do more, and you'll feel more relaxed with the the guys that are in there. This other program is just being started, so you know you got to look at that. You got tradition to go into, so I would follow the tradition. And I said, "Yeah, that's what I was planning on doing in the first place." <laughs> so I found a recruiter that was an SF recruiter. And it was my junior year in high school, and I had already received several letters from different schools. And when I went and visited them about wrestling, football, hockey, and stuff like this, they would only give me like a quarter grant. And then they found out how big I was, and they thought I was 175 pounds. And I was only 112. And they said, you're too small. (laughs) So I just left it at that. I followed the suggestion of my dad. And from that point on, it was just nose to the grindstone. Yeah. Because of my size, basic training, they tried to say, well, we don't know if you're going to make it. So you well, entered basic training where? What year? Fort Knox, uh, 64. 64, latter part of 64. And uh, I received time from when I signed that, when I signed that paper in my junior year. Right. That was added to my military time because that was a commitment already signed. Oh, is that right? Yeah. At that time. Yeah, yeah. And so we we went on from there, and um, as I went through the different areas, AD, uh, my advanced training, I advanced went Advanced infantry training. Yeah, I went through uh, communication at Fort Gordon, and that's where I met my buddy, Mike Tucker. No. Yeah. And we were, went through radio school together, 
and we come out pretty high in the class, so they decided to send us to uh, what they called a special messaging center, <laughs> okay? Yeah. And it was no more than special codes and the whole ball of wax. Did that include Morse code? Well, they were starting to teach it then. They were, it wasn't part of the program. It was more or less related to um, the radio teletype, the standard radios that the infantry right. carries and and that that type of thing when they had to send top secret messages or secret messages and that how the codes would be broken up and then it got a little bit into the morris code right and then from that point once we got out of there we went to jump school I was the last one off the bus <laughs> at Fort Benning. Took my duffel bag, threw it out from the top step, then jumped from the top step to the ground. And over to my left was this drill sergeant standing there and said, son, you might as well get back on the bus. I said, why is that, sergeant? He said, you're too light. You'll never open up the chute. <laughs> at 112 so, pounds. Yeah. And I turned around, I looked at him, and I said, sir, I said, I'm nothing against you, your rank, or the Army, but you're full of bullshit. <laughs> My dad was in, and he's the same <laughs> size I am, and he was a paratrooper during the Second World War in Korea. So don't give me your garbage. I said, I'm going through this, and when I come out of there, I went through with a gentleman that was uh mr football uh, i can't remember what state but i burned him several times <laughs> physical fitness he couldn't stay with me so i just proved him wrong there again and of course that you had extra attention from the the officer that uh, had bad mouth you at the beginning there right. of course so you had right. that additional but you managed through it right <laughs> it was just uh one one person after another just said that I was too small. Well, I've got my beret. I'm 53 years or more away from the SOG stuff that I've done. And uh, I'm still alive. I'm still small. <laughs> and I still have my friends in SOG. And we're able to talk about it now. Indeed. So um, after your jump school, did you go into the traditional army first before you went to special no. forces? No. You were able to go I, right up at the jump school. I was school? one of the lucky ones, I think, because I never served in a standard army unit or a standard military unit. Uh, I never did like that. I was kind of a kid that didn't like authority <laughs> that overused it. <laughs> you know, instead of just teaching them yes. and getting the job done, they would emboss on polish shoes, strings being tied right, uh, metals on straight, uh, pick up the butts that other people smoked and threw on the ground, too lazy to walk over and put it in a can. <laughs> um, you know, I just, yeah. uh, that was a type of authority I didn't like. If you would sit down and tell me what I'd done wrong, I'll accept it. But if you just yell at me, excuse me. <laughs> the bird just went out. <laughs> the but, bird was the word. Bird, right. <laughs> so um, the uh, you're in... You go through special forces training, and what was your MOS training there when you got there? Did Mike go? Were you and Mike still a dynamic Same. duel at that point? We went through training group together. We went through communications together. When we graduated, I figured we seen the last of each other. Right. Well, both of us got assigned to the sixth group, C Company, and sixth group. Which is at Fort Bragg at the time. At Fort Bragg. Everybody was at Fort Bragg except. The first. Right. They were in Okinawa. And the 10th group was in, in Germany. Germany, in Batos. 
And so we get assigned to the sixth group. We're there two weeks. Mike and I are on the same A team. Really? Unheard of. <laughs> Un unheard of. Two junior radio <laughs> operators on the same team. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I'm talking with Mike and that, and we've been introduced on the team and all this stuff, and I get a brilliant idea. I'm going to ask the team sergeant what we're going to do because we're two junior radio operators. Right. Well, he tells me, I, I ask him, I said, Sergeant, I said, can you tell me why they put two junior radio operators together? He said, well, Sergeant Sternberg, he said, I've already talked and I've got all your information from you, you and Mike going through the, the communication school and everything else and you all done very well. And uh, he said, Villa Rosa was my instructor. Sergeant no. Villa Rosa. Oh, yes. Sergeant First Class Paul Villa Rosa. Rosa. And he was somebody that I listened to. Sure. Okay. And so I said, you know, well, now that you've got the report on us, you know, there's two ranks there's a junior and a senior radio operator on the team <laughs> and he said well for being the smart one and mike i turn around to mike mike started smiling he said you're in trouble jordan <laughs> he said since you asked that question and i know what your next question is who does the paperwork <laughs> of the senior radio operator right and make sure that all the checks are done on all the radio he said, and since you codes. asked that question and you sound that intelligent, guess what? You get it for the first week and Mike gets it after that <laughs> and then you can rotate. <laughs> so uh, we left it at that and two weeks later from the heat of North Carolina, which it wasn't hot in January, right? we get sent to Fairbanks, Alaska for winter survival training. <laughs> I think it was 60 miles north or somewhere up there where it was colder than hell. And, wow. And he, uh, and we come back, we were up there six weeks, come back, and when we got back, we were with him two, two more weeks, and then they transferred Mike and I again. The dynamic duo. We went to third group. No. We were together on the same A team. C Company, <laughs> C Company, third group. <laughs> and we were with them for quite a while. And then we left and were reassigned to fifth group. And we had done something with the third group that I still don't know if they're going to talk about. So we'll leave it at that. And uh, then... We were assigned to the fifth group, and so we get. Dates. So by that time, was fifth group in the train? Oh, they were. Yeah, they were already there. Okay, so getting back to a calendar here. So this has been nineteen sixty-seven now. Yeah. You and Mike are back to third group. Now they're saying the good news is, gentlemen, you two are going well, to the train, fifth group. Right. We're going to fifth group, Vietnam, and, and then report. You reported there when? Did you Mike go over together? Yep. Yep. Oh my God! Yeah, we were in Vietnam. Survived out. that. We, yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so we ended up uh, in the train. We get there, and the number of replacements I can't remember, but there was enough of them. Yeah, because let me just to get back to is just a little thing from the book here that I want to get back to because there's another aspect of your history with Fifth Group in Vietnam that makes you another added unique personality and a part of our SOG legends. Um, uh, by the time that that bright light came up that we talked about earlier, you and Mike both had enough experience together that you respected each other enough that you could be the one zero 
which in SOG, a one zero is a team leader, one one's assistant team leader, the one two is the radio operator. Right. So in this case, you two would flip back and forth. forth. Right. And um, on several missions, you and Mike, and I forget what recon team it was, you ran missions out of FOB three at Kason. This is nine by this time is like nineteen sixty seven, the beginning of sixty eight, when the national headlines in America and around the world was the siege of Kason before and after the Tet Offensive, which was at the end of January sixty eight, and all the attention in the media was the Marine Corps and the air power directed against the NBA who were trying to overrun the Kason base. But what got no attention in the top secret world was FOB3. And you could talk a little bit about that, but I just want to get back to one more key point. And together on STR Oregon, both men respected each other's prowess in the field so much that they rotated one zero duty with strong results. They, meaning you and Mike, were among the first to photograph NVA bulldozer trails cutting thwats through triple canopy jungle to expand the Ho Chi Minh Trail complex. They photographed the tanks, including one shot where the NVA star was visible. And prior to that, this is prior to the NVA attacking the A camp, A101 at Lang Vey, which again was at the end of 1968, January. Yeah. And um, at one mission, you all had captured an NVA POW. You were flying back to FOB1 in a King B when one of the team members discovered that the POW was a woman. Sternberg and the team member holding the POW were so startled that they loosened their grip momentarily. The woman bolted from the H-34 and jumped to her death. I mean, that gives our listeners a little bit of an impression of the dedication of those soldiers, the Um, enemy. The... Propaganda used on their soldiers was so intense that um, the tactics that the North used to keep their soldiers in line, and that I would have to say was inhumane. It would be a tactic used in back through history where the so-called leaders of the country would threaten that person and the threats would be if you don't serve us we'll take your family out and when they said take your family out that meant all the way from your aunts your uncles any kind of kin that they could find that was related to you and they would kill them okay yeah, they Men, didn't women, out the children, dinner. anything. Right. Okay. And it would put a disgrace on your name. Well, I think the use of drugs and different things like that also would entice them. You know, they'd get to a state where they weren't in control of their own thoughts or their bodies. Right, so like you were in that bomb crater, here they come, you hit them two or three times, and they still move forward because they're obviously drugged or high on something. Right, and when you look in, when you look in a person's eyes and they're 10, 12 feet from you, and they're holding a weapon and a grenade, and you know that if anybody else took the number of shots and where the shots were taken, from a weapon in the chest, the stomach, the head, whatever, that the body would stop instantly. Well, the body don't stop. The forward motion and drive in that person's mind and then the muscles that it's reacting to is right now. It continues to move. 
And um, with that thought in mind, when a person holding a grenade and they're moving forward and they finally release it, they could be already dead, you know, but their motions carrying them. And that's how a lot of us got hurt in that bomb crater. And they're and dead wounded. before they hit the ground, right. but they're still. dead before they hit the ground. And I've been to several A1 reunions in Sevierville at the Tennessee Aviation Center where they have one of the remaining few A1s. A1 Sky Raider, Raiders. tail number 665 or 655? 655. Five. Six, five, five Indeed. Six, yeah. Yes. And uh, it still operates. I've still seen operates, them fly it. And it flew missions supporting SOG teams yeah. during the Secret War. Right. And uh, I've talked with several of their pilots, and a lot of their pilots remember some of that stuff <laughs> that my team did, you know. Absolutely. So they had to, they didn't know the team names. But they can remember the mission. Well, and, and then the same have. thing would be true for us. The right. recon teams that were on the ground, we right. didn't know the names of the pilots that no, came in. No, and I, over these years of them coming to our reunion and joining our organization and us going to them, I've met several of them. Right, and that organization we're speaking of is the Special Operations Gems. Association that was formed in 1976 by SOG recon men. Man. And then it was a span to hatchet force, and then the helicopter pilots, and then to the and then the A ones, and, and we've welcomed other other uh, assets in. They're welcome to join because right. they supported SOG, right. and we're alive today thanks to their heroism oh, and aviation skills. Those A one pilots and them Phantom pilots and the gun ships and extraction ships, um, and our especially our King B. Oh, yeah. Pilots and door gunners. Without them, I would have to say that 90% 90, 90 of us would be dead today. We'd be fertilizer and lay Yes, yeah, we'd be fertilizer regrown and spread <laughs> out a couple hundred times already. So let me take you back now to pre, um, pre-May pre when you're actually running missions out of Quezon. On that one mission, we took the photographs that proved their NVA tanks were there, and this is 1968 and the end of 67, and no tanks. The communists had not used tanks anywhere in the war, and there had been rumors, but you had direct evidence and proof. So from there, when you did, like when the recon team would come back to base, they would bring you into S2, you would get debriefed. The S3 people want to know anything about anti-aircraft sightings, anything new tactics on the ground. And then you would go back, clean up, feed the team, and get ready to go. But in this case, something else happened. People didn't quite believe what you all were saying. So no. at some point, what happened that was so different to you and Mike on this one mission and well, this was right around right December, early part of January of 68? January. It was 68. Just, just before, um, approximately two weeks before they hit Long, Long Bay. Bay. yeah. And uh, Mike and I didn't get back together. They separated us. At, at, well, t first of all, you do the mission. You come back. You do your you after, our, re our after action debriefing report. Debriefing at the yeah. camp and then. Go this down. is that food by now. That right. would be one. And then they separated no, you? No. Or down no. south? What they did is when we face, came in the country, yeah. they had us together. And when, when we you came walked, back from the mission? No. When when we went from Natra, uh, Natrang to uh, our camps that right. we were issued to, Mike got off to King Bee at Food Bike. They sent me to Quezon. Quezon. Oh. So once I got to Quezon, everything, you know, we knew that people were moving around. Right. We could hear them at night. And so could we just do a little sidebar here just for people who've never heard the word Quezon, how significant that was because that siege went on for several months. Every day you had artillery coming in. 
rockets, and there was always activity Mortar, outside the yeah. base, mortars, yeah. and we lost men there and men who were seriously injured just from all the artillery. And meanwhile, you and your recon teams and other SOG teams were running missions across the fence right. from we, that uh, base. That day that we... Um, so you're in Quezon now. Right. I'm in Quezon. My one zero is John McGovern at the time. And uh, the third American was Joe Conlon. E6, <laughs> AKA Pigpen. Right. An E6 and an E7. Right. And we go out and we're supposed to observe what's going on on the other side of the river. Yeah. So we head out in a direction towards Korok Mountain, which was very distinct. You could see it from Quezon. And, and, and for our viewers, tell them why there's an additional unique aspect to Korok, which was dominated by the North Vietnamese Army. Right. They had guns. <laughs> in they had the guns mountain. that could come out on tracks, fire and, on the base, and then retract. Retract before the fighters could get in there. And they could throw everything in, in a, on the place, and it's not going to move it might take a couple chips off the outside <laughs> because I think that mount, mountain was made out of granite. The rock in it was granite. Yeah. And they were able to carve through it, do all this fancy stuff over the years. And I still swore that the guns that they had inside were sitting on tracks that were pulled up there after they were loaded and the recoil would take them back down, and they'd reload them and then bring them back up. And I thought they were as big as the ones that Hitler had on railroad cars. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's very possible, but... It was a huge round, whatever well, it was like. Whatever Someone said it was, it was a 157, possibly. Oh, it was big. Yeah. It was big. You could hear it whistling if it went by you. Right. <laughs> and I guess at one point, Quezon was taken... Uh, around 1,500 rounds a day. A day. And I was there from December to April, or from actually from August to April of 67, 68. And 68 in April is when they shipped me to Fubai. Right. And Mike and I started running. The minute I walked in the gate, Mike said, you and me are together. He knew I was coming for some reason. <laughs> and so that's where Oregon got tied up. Before I was with a brew team, John McGovern, Joe Conlon, and there were several other. So get back to that mission then. Could you take the well, photographs? we went out for observation. And McGovern was the one zero? McGovern was one zero. I was a radio operator. Joe Conlon was the one two. Okay, very good. Okay. Yeah. And on our way back, we always radioed ahead to inform the team that was the A team that was in Camp 101 at Long Bay that they would have a team in their area, okay? And uh, so we stayed outside of their kill zone. And SF camps had the inner wire, outer wire, minefields in the wire, and then they had a clean area, sometimes went out 300 yards to 400 yards is what they tried to clear so it would be open view to all of their firing area so they wouldn't get any closer than that. Right. Well, as we were moving through the brush, as we were moving through the brush in that, and I spotted something, and I said, wait a minute. So... I said, Joe, take this camera. I had the camera also. And he took, the, we had. Uh, Pentax? Pen, pen, uh, Pentax. Pentax. Yeah. Belize. Yeah. And he, uh, he took the camera and he says, what's up? And I said, look at this. And you could see a track going in the brush. And I seen branches broke on a couple different trees. And I said, this isn't right. So I started taking pictures of it. And I used my hands, and I used the butt and extended portion 
the car extended 15. extended stock on the car 15. Yeah. Those are all positive measurements, okay? They can understand what I was referring to by that. I give them the, the width between the tracks, the height at the, which the weeds and branches on smaller bushes were broke, which will give them the height from the, the height from the ground to the bottom of the tank right. or, or track vehicle, whatever it was. Sure. And then I give them the outside dimension with so many photos of me using the weapon. So you came to a conclusion there was a tank. That was a tank. It had to be. You could see where the turret had swung around and broke branches off at a certain height. So I used my weapon on that tree. And, right. You know, to me, that's what I used in, in the report. Sure. Well, it wasn't, I don't know, maybe by the time Saigon got it down at SOG headquarters, they said, okay, it's time to call this team down. There was only about three days. We were still in duty, dirty uniforms at that time because all the garbage being fired into the camp. Yeah. Well, at that at that point, we we knew that the three of us were going to have to go down. So we had a King B come in the morning. We got on it, went down there carrying our weapons. I don't go anywhere in a war zone without a weapon. I don't care who you are. Yeah. <laughs> and so we went to Natrang. They flew us out of Natrang to Saigon and once we got down there we had an E6 out there on guard duty tell us we couldn't At take SOG them headquarters. In. SOG headquarters couldn't take the weapons and I said sorry sorry I don't go anywhere without a <laughs> weapon and besides that it's loaded yeah so all I have to do is flip that switch and you're ready to rock and roll so we're down here for information so Whoever your boss is, you better get him out here because we ain't going anywhere without these weapons. My team sir, my team leader, one zero John McGovern, just pats me on the shoulder. At that point, I had a, a point. I had a feeling in my system that I've had enough of authority at that <laughs> point. So I, we went inside. E7 said, you got to leave your weapons here. I said, sorry, Sarge, I don't go anywhere. I'll take the round out of the chamber, but the magazine stays in it. That's a compromise he accepted? Yeah, yeah, that's what he, I'll take the round out of the chamber <laughs> and I'll leave it on safe, but the magazine stays in it and I've got the round in my hand and the rest of them in the magazine. We went in, we sat down. Sergeant that was in, in charge of that area mm -hmm. said, uh, the panel will be in in a minute. You can talk to them. Well, they came in. There was a Air Force colonel, an Army colonel, a Marine colonel. And then there was a a one-star general, I'm almost sure it was. I can't remember who, it was. all of them, but first one to talk A lot about, of brass. A lot of brass. You got their attention with your after-action report, reporting right. the possibility of, so of tanks. The intel department had questions, so they wouldn't have called us down there unless they did, and the way I described it. So we get down there, we got no markings on our uniform, no ID saying who the hell we were, or identifying marks, no rank, no nothing. And so first questions out of the, and why they had the Marine Colonel there beyond me, he had no business in there. <laughs> and his first questions were, who took the photos? Well, John took his hand, pointed like that at me, I said, okay, what is your question again? And the colonel said, who took the pictures? I said, all the photos in there, 
that depict my hands and my arms and me holding the weapon were taken by this gentleman. And I pointed to Joe. Joe, yeah. And he said, who made the determination on the way you referred to the measurements? I said, I did, because I'm so many years old, and my hands are not going to change. I'm 5'4", 112 pounds. That isn't going to change. (laughs) <laughs> so they're a positive measurement within fractions of an inch. And he says, okay, tell me what you think this is. And it was one of the photographs I took and then describing the distance between the inside measurement between the tracks and the height at which the bottom of the vehicle would have been Right. In comparison to the ground. And he said, how did you determine that? I said, with the rifle, my hands, and the extension of the stock on the car 15. Okay. So the bottom line was he wasn't believing the fact right. that you the, felt the, you what had I de- What I determined yeah. in, in our discussion to that point is that he wasn't going to believe anything we said. So I just let him go on with his question. He said, can you be positive that those are your pictures? I said, yes, them are my hands. See, that one's got a kink going this way, this way, and that's from me playing football, getting my hands stepped on by cleats and fighting (laughs) when I was boxing and, and hockey. Oh, okay. Well, from what we determined, I said, what? All of you is determined or you determined? He said, well, what I determined was that I don't think that you guys seen tank tracks. I said, okay, are you a governing factor in this panel? And he said, one of them. I said, why? And he said, I'm a full bird colonel. I said, yeah, but you're in the Marine Corps. You guys, you guys operate totally different than what we do. And if you think that I'm going out there to build stories up, that's not the reason why I went into Special Forces. Ooh. I went in to do my job with the best. And if... I don't expect anything less of me than what I expected of members around me of that community. And if you don't believe me, why am I down here? Right. Okay. Sure. We're getting the. And that's the first time that they ever brought you down a side. Right. Right. And I said, if you don't believe us, out in the woods or jungle like we are, then you probably don't even believe your men that are in the core. And he said, well, was that a remark against me? I said, well, you can take it whatever you want to. (laughs) If you don't believe me, I'm out there with five Indig and normally two Americans. Now we got a little bit bigger team with three Americans and eight in Dig, and you're still not believing me. I said, you have people in the core that go out in platoons, companies, battalions. We're operating with anywhere from 10 to 5. And when you start questioning me, that means that you question them. And that's not a good idea. You've got to start listening to the people that are out in the field. People that are on the ground. The people that are on the ground. I'm not doing it for my health. I can tell you that much. <laughs> when you're outnumbered 10 to 1 or 100 to 1, you're not in a favorable situation. And I don't want that camp in there because I know people in that camp. 
and I don't want him hurt. Nobody else on the panel said anything. He said, well, I'll have to say that I don't believe a word you're saying. I don't believe the pictures. I said, you know what? I don't really give a shit what you think. And how you got on this panel is beyond me or what you're even doing in this building. From that point on, you can think whatever you want to of me about me, but I got no respect for you as an individual. Your rank, yeah. The core, yes. I got several friends in it. But as for you, you're a jerk. <laughs> and that's when the lead man in the panel said, okay, we're all going to break up here. You four go in that room. So, I'll come over and talk to you. All right. Cause, so after all that's done, then... Uh, let's fast forward because we've had other interviews or personal contact with one of the men that served at Lang Vey. And when we talked to them, uh, Paul Longrier was, was a, a first lieutenant, yeah. then retired as a colonel, highly respected. He was there when they got hit by tanks. And uh, subsequently, we've talked to Paul, and he said we never had – any intel reports that from SF he said we were told that the Air Force had reports of suspicions about tanks. So this is an Air Force report that could be could be credible or not. Had they told us at our Green Beret camp at Langvey A101 that the photographs taken were by SF men. Because I don't think the traditional A camp men knew that SOG existed. They didn't no. know we had Green Berets across the fence. That was so top secret compartmentalization. He said, had we known those were Green Berets that said we saw this, that would have made a world of difference. But they didn't. So that's just one of those episodes that you're a part of that show where there's an inclination by higher ups in buildings far away from the battlefield, make command decisions and judgments, not based on facts, but opinions. So you were a victim of that. Eventually, you returned to Quezon, where your team with McGovern ran other missions, and then you get the FOB-1, Mike Tucker, you do your historic bright light. But then after that, you and Mike still ran a few more missions. Oh, we ran quite a few more missions. You did, Uh, and... uh, if you let's go back to a couple of your well, more we, memorable ones during your SOG time. We uh, we got called out on several bright lights, and we also had our regular missions. And just on one of our regular missions, we we ran a ridge top. This is in Laos now. This is in Laos, and uh, we ran the ridge top, and one side. We would have been the, because Ashall run kind of northwest to southeast. Right. And we were on the east side on the ridge, and we could actually see the road from the top of the ridge going right down to Ashall. Sure. And uh, we got all kinds of noise around us. Okay. Close to the team. Close to the team. We were, I, I would have to say that they were using the, the bamboo. The trackers would four-corner you. And when you heard the first beat of those sticks, they were boxing your team. And then if you heard them again, the box would become smaller. Oh, is that right? They they. Seem to close in, yeah, yeah. which means they knew pretty much where you, and you had to you had to find a way out. And usually, you had to move now, not a couple seconds later or, <laughs> or a minute. It had to be now. No time for a tea break. You had right. to get up. You and had go. to act now. So we would take our chances and head for the middle of one of those legs of that 
Uh, and while box. trying to keep the high ground advantage right. if possible. We wanted the high ground because that side was the safe side for us. Sure. Well, we ended up hanging off of a cliff <laughs> with our, we usually had 25-foot lanyards and a, like a Swiss seat. Yeah, six-foot piece of rope. Right. And then we would have a uh, another clip that we could clip on and and stay on the rope that we had around a tree or a rock or whatever. And we suspended ourselves over the side and covered it up. And our whole team was on the side, and we were there all night. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, trying to get up before daylight, once they moved out, they never even seen us. Never. Could you hear over. them move past? Uh, they moved past because they couldn't find any tracks. Right. You know. Sure. And uh, we never filed, as long as I, Mike and I were together, never followed a trail. We would be one side of it or not, and we would try to intermittent side steps. And uh, we were so light, really, sometimes I think we were above the ground. <laughs> so somebody was watching over us. But once we got up, it was hard to move your legs. You know, being, I don't know, it might have been 10, 11 o'clock at night or something like that when we were up there. I was still able to make radio contact. At midnight. You know, but make sure to um, not do it when they were right. close. <laughs> so that's how that happened. But we were able to stay in for a while and able to make some photographs from some military reports from traffic in the valley traffic in the valley and by that time once we started airborne and out of the area yeah and just be just for a point of reference the ashaw valley throughout the vietnam war and i corps was the most dangerous area we had more green berets killed there more teams hit either wiped out or severely um injured injured and so you're in one of the worst target areas, and well, there had uh, been there had been teams in there, and what they would do would be change the lettering and the numbers of the target. on the targets. But <laughs> you would say, well, when you look on the map, when the coordinates come out, you would know that that was the same target that three teams before that were in, and two of them were all shot up, and one's missing. So. They were using, trying to get real information out of that area, and they didn't know sooner or later somebody was going to pick that up, that they were changing the numbers. and. Oh, yeah, because the team leaders are talking amongst themselves a little right, bit. Right. When you come back, you definitely talk to the other teams. So that, that <laughs> that's just some of the hairy stuff. And so... Um, when does your tour of duty in SOG wrap up? Do you and Mike wrap up together? Yeah, what we And then from up, there, yeah, we just went to over, talk about the remaining of your 10 years in the Army, well, kind of go through we, it. At different times, Mike and I would talk and <laughs> say, well, are, you, are we going to extend over here? Or are we going to go home? Well, we get to that point, and then they call a team on a bright light or a, or a uh, we get BDA for a bomb damage assessment, right? Or go in and try to photograph this or pick up some sounding devices and that. Yeah, did you ever insert those Air Force uh, sounding devices? Yeah, yeah, because those are three units. They had a central Sound, unit yeah. with the coaxial cables that those, went out, right? And you had to put them next to a trail. And uh, we had put one in the Ashall. Do you remember where you put yours? Oh. Well, anyways, you put it in. Right. And that's still right. a hairy mission because you go into an enemy territory. Now you no, are right. on a trail. You're right next to the trail putting right. these things in right. so you can have any enemy right. any time. Well, the uh, Air Force used to drop... The Air Force used to drop stuff that would land in the in the jungle. Right. 
and you would have to look they give you a coordinate and you'd have to locate where it was at well those sound <laughs> right those sounding devices yeah would pick up the motor sounds uh if several people walked by they could tell how many people and all this technical stuff that i didn't get into right and but so let me get this straight this is the first i heard about this kind of a mission where the air force drops the sensors and now they say oh spike team oregon go find them and see how they're working well no we had to pick them up we were supposed to bring them back they were actually devices that I'm trying to remember how they uh, how they how they operated, but uh, well, we they, had they would have in. radio frequencies, and once they're put in, they could pick up the sensors, and the they Air could, Force right. would come by and monitor them. Moonbeam right. or Hillsborough would come right. by and get the intel off these. Right, but they couldn't they only leave them in for so long. Yeah, they didn't want to leave them in there. Then they knew that people would pick them up and trace them back, and then now they got information that the u.s is in there and then it becomes a big political yeah war. they see that made in usa tag yeah. on, on <laughs> yeah. these sensors or and a, layouts. or a bunch of it's the first clue bunch of serial numbers <laughs> you know made by dupont or whatever right well that kind of stuff went on all the time so you actually got in you actually found one you brought it back yeah. and turned it over to them and of course the air force and the cia all said hey thanks george yeah well, that, we didn't get to see them, but that went down to the chain of command. <laughs> but uh, And again, on a routine mission like that, even when you leave the AO, you're under fire. Oh, that, on that one, uh, we ended up taking fire on the... Insert? On, on the insert. Oh, God. <laughs> more so on the extraction. Extra. Yeah. And the door gunner got hit. Okay. Yeah. It hit him right across here. Well, I got a cravat and a uh, pressure bandage on it. And Mike took him at that time. We only had uh, three, five. We had six of us, and we were all on the chopper, on the one chopper. Yeah. And so Mike took him, held the cravat on, and I took the door gun over. And... Fifty some years later, John was at the thing, and we received awards. And I got a air medal with a V, which was the <laughs> second one I got. And you know, that's something Sog didn't get, right? You know, I mean, air medals just for our listening audience or viewing audience. An air medal is awarded after you accumulate a certain so, number of hours on combat missions. You have to keep a log turn the log in at a certain number. I forget what the exact rounds are. So that's for a traditional air medal, which there are helicopter pilots that would have 60, 70 because they flew so many missions. Mission. Now, yeah. the difference here is that you get the air medal with a V device, V as in Valor. And in this case, you earn that because you took over the door gunner slot. After he gets wounded, you patch him up and you go to his thirty caliber during the extraction. Right, and uh, bands that we had little nicks and that stuff from yeah shrapnel, sh just normal shrapnel fire. <laughs> and uh, how many purple hearts did you get? Well, as of today, I think I got six. <laughs> and that's all. <laughs> that's it. But you know, a lot of them, a lot of them, we wouldn't. Nobody would even turn in. We'd go to right, our just medic. another day in SOG. Right. Yeah. They, if you needed a couple stitches, they'd put a couple stitches in. If you needed uh, medication or disinfectant or something like that, they would take care of that. But it was our medics. Yeah, the Green Brain medics. I can't. Right. And nobody, the best ex in the world. nobody expected anything. Right. You know. And down the road, you didn't even think about it. Bins a lot of operators out of SOG recon teams were young guys. They didn't think anything about medals. Like I said, there's I've gotten several medals in the last, well, in the five years that they were awarding them yeah. to us back five to eight years ago. Well, this is again, we're talking about the Special Operations Association where they worked 
with government officials on people like yourself who had served on missions and the uh, went back thanks to people at the SOA and, and members as well as um, a couple of National Guard people. Uh, one, Neil, Neil Thorne comes to mind. And we had a couple other people that I'm not uh, naming right now, but they went back, went to Congress, to the senators, got the awards, and then at our reunion, they were awarded. People like yourself, Tony Harrell, Big Pen, were getting awards that, that everything that went from a Silver Star down to an accommodation medal for Valor or your Air Medal with Valor. Yeah. And that was what we're speaking of here, which again, it was awards earned in combat, but again, never received, never received military service during during the time we're in, and a lot of times the uh, the S one shops, which are awards and decorations, it was one of their functions. They're busy, and or our people like Purple Hearts. You tried to stay away from a Purple Heart. <laughs> Didn't do you any good. Didn't do any good. <laughs> but that was again that's the that's the mindset. Uh, nobody joined SOG to, to obtain medals. They had a mission. We were there to do the mission, the quiet professional tradition to yeah. move on. I think I think everybody that operated out of SOG that ran recon and understood the severity of what we could bring to the table, even though sometimes we thought we were young, used out there as a piece <laughs> of meat on a string, well, so. could run that run that out a little bit because um, I think that um, when you and I we've been in it, we've we've heard this expression. But when you say it that way, uh, take it a little step further. So you're to meet SOG headquarters says piece of meat, which in this case would be RT or ST Oregon. Right. Go to target S three or whatever it would be. You're in the target. And the reason why you feel like you're a little bit of a piece of meat is because? Well, we'd get in there, and there'd be gunfire already. <laughs> and you're 1,500 feet off the ground. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you see a bunch of little bright lights, like stars lighting up in the helicopter where it comes rounds coming through. Or it'd take out a hydraulic line. You'd have oil all over the floor. And, you know, you just felt like you were uh, raw meat out there as a, to draw everybody out. Well, when everybody come out, next thing you know, here was the air assets. And after you left, here come a wing of B-52s in there on a, a arc light and just arc light the whole area. And arc light, pretty heavy damage. And arc light is a B-52 strike that would come in immediately after the team or as close after the team left the area of operations because there was so much enemy activity that the Air Force and the Intel people in Saigon thought it was worth coming back. So then you're the meat, the NVA comes to you, they attack you, and by only by the grace of the Lord and, and heroic aviators, your team gets out, the NVA are heavy clustered, in that area, the B fifty twos come in, and just and then sometimes did you have to do a bomb damage assessment? And you know, that would be after the B fifty twos come in, then the Air Force goes, "Hey, could you guys go out and check out to see? Do us a what, give us a head count. How many kind, people did we kill, or something like that?" Yeah, you'd get close enough to maybe get some kind of approximate and what equipment was damaged and that. Right. If you told them track vehicles and stuff <laughs> like this, you know, you know that they would just shake their head and say, yeah, they don't have any track vehicles. Right. You know, you'd see a, a couple dozen Jeeps or a bunch of... Well, uh, and also with the with the BDA, we were told, hey, no, we just hit it with a B-52 strike. The enemy's going to be dead or they'll be walking around like zombies because they're, they're so stunned... stunned. Right. Well, the truth of the matter is when a recon team got into an area where you're doing a bomb damage assessment, the truth of the matter is the soldiers, the enemy soldiers, are indeed alive and they're not happy. Right, yeah. They're not happy at all. 
<laughs> believe me. Yeah. And uh, vengeance. They want some vengeance. Right. That and that's usually when you get fire from all over the place. There might be a a company down here and in our US military a company was approximately two hundred and fifty men. There'd be a company here, there might be two companies <laughs> over here, you know, they'd be scattered out, but you'd you'd be walking into a battalion or bigger. Right. And again for our, our, our viewers, um with SOG missions, when a recon team went across the fence, we had no traditional support from conventional units, no artillery, and um, no unit could come and wreck you. We did have the best Air Force in the world, and we did have outstanding Army gunships, and, and of course the heroic, ships. yes, yeah. and the, the slicks or the king bees right. that was a vital support element. Right. So when you went across the fence, you were there. Alone. You had to. You're you had to make the call, though, to be extracted, and you had to make the call that you needed support. Right, and sometimes you would, after being in a tactical situation, like you'd hear the enemy closing in on you, and you would say, "I want a tactical extraction," meaning you wanted to be extracted because you knew danger was approaching. So rather than get involved in a firefight, we can report the enemies here, or we've seen pictures of the trails there. Pull us out. We'll come back. We'll do another mission another day. They would go, uh, request denied. Right. Oh, yeah. Break yeah. contact, continue mission. Right. Which would be the most dreaded words any team. And yeah. also, usually those words would be uttered by an officer somewhere flying far away in a command and control aircraft that's not on the ground with you or somebody at headquarters who would say, uh, request denied, break contact, continue mission without realizing what exactly you, the recon man on the ground, is up against. Yeah. The uh, I, majority of the time, they didn't have um, the knowledge of the size of the groups that were hitting our recon teams. When we would get located and they'd finally have our position, the size and numbers were just astronomical, you know. And after being away from it for all these years and that, um, when I think about it, I just <laughs> say, what the hell was I doing? <laughs> you know, but I know it had to be done. And I think that with the group of people we had and the dedication to what they were doing is the only reason that a majority of us are left. And what's left isn't very many. And there, I've talked with several people. I talked with John Meyer Tilt and Major General Eldon Bargewell. And, the Frenchman. And Doug the Frenchman, which <laughs> is a personal friend of mine. And... Uh, you know, different people like this had actually done it, okay, to be on a recon team and to get to that point and stay alive and discuss the number of people that done it over those years. You're finding men that did it two times, three times, and if you start adding that up, we tried to get what the historian and a member that did a lot of research Steve Sherman that it wasn't very many that were on the ground you're probably looking at 500 maybe yeah, I think the numbers if uh, just for again for our audience that might be listening for the first time during the entire Vietnam War we had 3.2 million Americans that served including 500,000 sailors that would be off coast that would come in for leave and out of that, approximately 20,000 were Green Berets that were in country running traditional A camps, which was highly dangerous duty. A lot of the right A camps. Right on the borders. Were right on the border, like Lang Vey. Yeah. And so, this is, we're not talking about uh, having tea and crumpets for lunch. No. This was dangerous duty every day. And again, they would hit you when they wanted to hit you. So, those are our traditional A camps. Then getting to SOG. 
Uh, mm-hmm. The men that volunteered, there would be about 2,000 out of 2,000, approximately, depending who you talk to, four to six or 700 th- men, Green Berets, that went across the fence and running recon. And the sidebar to this, to today, the element, the number that's still very heavy in every SOG recon man's heart is that there are 50 Green Berets from the Secret War, like Glenn Lane, Robert Owen, others that are still listed as missing in action, Shame. that our right. government's trying to work with to get the remains Vietnamese. returned, yeah. and over 100 aviators that died supporting us, right. Army, Air Force, South Vietnamese, right. and the Marine Corps, because yeah. we had Scarface and other Marine units that rotated through that supported our missions across the fence right. that were heroic. Aviation right. skills unquestioned, and we're alive. You and I are alive yeah. today. Thanks to that fearless, those aviators, and again, a little bit of luck from the recon guys that enabled us to get out. So with that thought in mind, uh, wrap up the last few years of your Army experience. Well, and again, you were with Special Forces. Right. I stayed with Special Forces until my my dad started getting sick in, in 72. And I still had five brothers and sisters right. at home. That and you were the junior, oldest. Junior high and high school. And you were the oldest in your family. I was the oldest in the family. And they all had to go finish out their education before they could go on anywhere. Well, my ma couldn't make enough money. My dad being sick off and on, he worked for General Motors after he got out of the military and was a tool and dime maker. But then, you know, when he passed, I talked with the sergeant major in the fifth group. The returning people from Vietnam had a a group that were at Bragg that were they were trying to place or send back or whatever, but stay with SF. And if you were a SOG member, they try to keep you together. And then if you wanted to go back, you just went back, you know. But a lot of the, after that, you know, I'd make a couple trips back and forth to Ohio every couple months to see how my dad was doing. And this is while you're at Fort Bragg with third right. group again. No, with I was still with the fifth group in the returning. Okay. Group, you know, and I pulled duty. We were on uh, Mike and I were on a committee that they had started to set up the new commando school yeah and we kept getting stuffed by <laughs> by the upper brass from like 82nd hunter for no no we got recondo schools we don't need special forces to have their own stuff while well, they were trying to get rid of us anyhow so. right well that that's that's, another that, story. that's a whole different story there <laughs> and that could go lead into a lot of headaches <laughs> But uh, so you're was, in until I was in, your, actually, your father I passed got, away. My dad passed away in in seventy three. Right, and then after that, I ended up uh, going back home with. So when you get out, I mean, how many years of service had you already had at that point? You were an E seven at least. No, at that point was at least uh, nine. By by the time my dad got sick, because as a junior, we got credit for when we signed up. Once right. you put your name on that thing, you've committed to the military. Sure. And as long as you kept your grades up and your physical condition, you're going to get in SF, but they're going to screen you again. <laughs> okay? Yeah. They're going to go through that process again. And I was lucky enough, one of the lucker guys, that I came in, I never had to serve in any other branch other than special forces. That's why I say that when you start going in and doing what you kids nowadays call black ops, this is the real thing. Indeed. And it's no game. If you think you're going to get by, by sleeping on duty or not listening to an instructor, you're nuts. You're going to die if you're good enough to make it. But believe me, 
that group of guys that are in that special operations unit or in special forces in general at the time I was in were meant to be there at that time. They were that good, and even though a lot of them were killed, it it is a special group. And the camaraderie is by far more than I've seen in any organization I belong to. Indeed. And I've been in several fire departments, arson investigation, baseball, <laughs> hockey, football, track. So this, you could do a little bit of that. So after 10 years, you, were, you served 10 years, and when you got out of the Army, what was your rank? Uh, I was actually... Could have been carrying a uh, sergeant first class stripes. Wow. But when I got out, I had already made it through the process and done everything I had to do. Done a review boards. Be, right. So you and were E8 eligible. I was E8 promotable. eligible. Promotable. There we go. But I knew it was going to take at least a year or more right. even thinking about it. And then you had to prove yourself again. <laughs> okay but that didn't bother me and uh, when I got out I went home I spent the rest of my time volunteer on a volunteer fire department ice and investigator uh, county investigator uh, and union you also carp- had had union skills yeah I was a carpenter for almost 40 years and uh I retired at the age of 60 and said, that's it. (laughs) And then after arguing with the VA for 17 years, that my knees were bad and having Social Security grant me I had bad knees, then the The VA VA came around and believed them, and I got two new knees in 2008. You walk better now than you did in Vietnam. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, not really. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes. I remember watching you. Never mind. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was uh, that was a trip arguing with them. Indeed. But I've got it now. Sure, I dream about stuff that happened, and that's all I dream about. Is that right? But, yeah. I that was that's part of my. PTSD sure. problem. I'm not violent with anybody, but I hate stupid loudmouths. <laughs> and so, as you wrap up here, you and Sally, your sweetheart today, and you live in where? And how many grandchildren? In, great grand? Are you up to the great great grandchildren yet? I know you no, got great great grandchildren. Yeah, yeah, we've indeed. got. Uh, between us, a head count here. Uh, between us, we had nine children right three are mine six are hers Mm -hmm. Uh, we were never married and but you're living happily ever after yeah she's a great cook we got uh 21 grandchildren (laughs) and i'm almost positive i can't tell anymore i'm just trying to remember names (laughs) and birth dates but we're got uh 18 or 19 great grandchildren. You got one in the oven, right? No, I, well, there, yeah, there <laughs> yeah. are several that are possible, <laughs> but we'll leave it at that because right. at any given time, it can go. Indeed. So, this is uh, you return, you're back up in Oregon, Ohio, yeah. a member of STRT Oregon. And, and uh, as we wrap up here, we come down to the final. Uh, part of our our first SOG cast. Um, Anything additional you'd like to add at this point, Um, just as a final thought from you, sir? Um, I think the men of SF, whether it be nowadays or not, are put in situations that could be eliminated if, the information they get from other SF or people that are sent out on special 
assignments start believing what they say and if it's an intel type situation they're not out there for their health they're out there to bring strength to what they're trying to accomplish and when you start believing in the people that are out there doing this you're going to have total better results you're going to have people that are going to want to be part of it and it won't be just down to a few you'll have the success of a lot of people with a lot of knowledge that'll do that and bring the information back to you but you got to start believing them and and believe me you got the best and there's no question in my mind about that all right well again george we thank you for coming in today for our first sawcast <laughs> and uh we're sitting here we want to thank jocko and his right hand uh, technical assistant echo charles who gave us a uh, top secret uh, assistant here that's joined us today to make this uh, podcast uh, possible um again we were reading earlier from Across the Fence, which was the first book I put out. There's a couple other books that I had. Uh, you can go to our website with SOG Chronicles and go to Amazon.com. There are other SOG books that are coming out. Lynn Black's. Um, we have a Whiskey Tango mm-hmm. Foxtrot. Right. And the, Nick Brockhouse has done We Few. And Jason Hardy has done a series of um, SOG Recon books. Oh. And uh, so with Amazon now, they're beginning to publicize and run more of these books. And then also, uh, again, to thank our primary sponsor, Jocko and Echo, for getting us here today. And if you go to his podcast, he's got a whole social network of things going. And, of course, books. And uh, he has the Echelon Front Leadership Training. And even under his books, The Leadership Strategy and Tactics, um, when that book came out uh, last year, we were up in L.A., and they had a tremendous response, a full house, and they talked about discipline. And that even impacted my uh, stepson, Ryan, at the time greatly. And we'll be for grateful for Echo doing that. We are all available on social media. Uh, if you go to Instagram account for myself, it would be J Striker, my initial J. Facebook, Saw Chronicles, Echo, and Jocko are both there. If you go to at Echo Charles or at Jocko Willink, who, of course, served two tours of duty in in Iraq with Navy SEALs. He was the officer in charge at the Ramadi for uh, Task Force Bruiser. And um, we are thankful for that. We will return again soon with our next second SOGcast, where our scheduled guest will be Jim Shorten Jones, who ran missions out of CCC. And before he joined SOG, he served a tour of duty with the Navy. After SOG, he served a tour of duty with Air Force Reserve as a uh, para rescue man, PJ. We have amazing stories. But the most amazing thing about Jim that we're looking forward to sharing with the viewers will be he's the only man I know, service member, who out of his own pocket returned to the SOG area of operations to complete an attempt to complete a bright light mission. His recon team went in, got shot out, and we will come back with his full story, and that'll be SOGcast 2, and we're presently lining up more interviews of our SOG members. And with that, we'll sign off with the traditional Jocko sign-off where we are grateful for members like you, George, and all our service members today who serve to keep our country free. We thank our first responders, Border Patrol, particularly during these difficult times, all of our law enforcement agencies, and then any first responders and during the COVID virus, even the people at the hospitals that are helping our people to our country to move forward and to come back. So with that, we will close. Thank you. God bless America.
We'll be back with Sodcast another day.